Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. As labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night nor to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith, love, as as breastplates and the hope of salvation as helmets. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just in fact as you are doing. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Um, so this is something we want to be talking about for God willing, if, if the Lord hasn't come, we want to keep uh, discussing this about uh, the Lord's day. Am I saying that right? The day of the Lord. I'm sorry. So you guys, you guys, I, want, I need a favor from you, right? Because I've been doing this a lot. I've been calling the day of the Lord the Lord today, and they're two different things. So, so, so if I do that during my sermon, just raise your hand and remind me so I can fix it, all right? Um, it's the dyslexia. It just needs to say it the other way around. But we are talking about the day of the Lord. That's what we're going to be talking about. And what does that mean? And, and how does that look? And, and all the different aspects of, of what our past experience are. Our, um, our experiences now and, and the things that we experience in life. How do they all play into this? And so we'll be, we'll be covering some of that about the day of the Lord, right? Um, but first, <laughs> but first, right? Um, there was a young mother who took her little girl, Layla, to a wedding. <laughs> and... Um, and she was, this was her first wedding, and she was so wide-eyed and looking at everything that was going on. And she asked her mother, she sees the bride coming in beautiful white and, and a beautiful gown, and she asked her mom, 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 why is the bride wearing white? Well, the mother didn't want to get into all about purity and all that right at that moment. So she says, she's wearing white because this is the happiest day of her life. And so she's wearing white because she's so happy. And the little girl smiles. And then a few seconds late, later, she says, as she looks around, she says, Mom, why is the groom wearing black? <laughs> See, that, that's a bad joke. Because young men today and they have a problem committing to begin with, and then to hear that joke is kind of reinforcing that, right? I, I repent from that, okay. Just kidding, just kidding, all joking aside. Um, we see, if we, if we look at the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 11, um, we see something happening here where the apostles who were walking and, and, and um, living together with, with the resurrected Jesus Christ all of a sudden, Jesus is taken up into the sky. But as he's taken into the sky, there's some angels nearby, and this is what they say to them. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Thus is the promise of the day of the Lord. 
Now, if we read scripture, we see that the day of the Lord goes back. I mean, it goes way back. It, it goes even to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, where we see a promise made. God makes this promise to whom? To a fallen race. Men had sinned against God. They were now separated from God. The DNA of sin was now grafted into man. And yet God makes this promise that from out of the woman's seed will come forth one who will trample on the serpent's head, even though his heel would get bruised. And so we see that this promise of the Lord's day, or the day of the Lord, here I go again, the day of the Lord goes way back to the beginning. A promise made of a Messiah. That promise was kept. We Christians believe that in Nazareth, in Bethlehem, one night, one evening, God himself came to earth. Emmanuel, as the Messiah, as the Redeemer, as the fulfiller of that promise. Then there's other promises in Scripture that that same Messiah would be betrayed, and that happened. And there's promises that that same Messiah would then be beaten by sinful men, and that did happen. And that same Messiah would be then um, nailed to a cross and crucified for our sin. And we believe, and history tells us, that that happened. God's promises came true but there's one more promise there's one more promise of the Messiah that needs to be fulfilled and we are living within those days you see from the day that Jesus ascended into heaven mankind has been living in the last days. The only problem is the last days for us might be longer than what they are for God. But God made this promise and God will keep that promise. The promise that the day of the Lord will most certainly Now, in, in our church culture, what has happened is that because of this promise, and because of prophecies in the Bible, and because of books of revealing end times, um, curiosity has taken a greater pull on our Christian culture than what it should. And I'm going to explain that. You see, for some for, for the most part, what has happened is that the church has become so informed with the information of the last days that we have missed the message of the day of the Lord. The message of the day of the Lord. You see, this is what the Thessalonians were going through. The church of Thessalonica. When Paul writes to them in this epistle, um, this, this whole excitement that we want to hear more about dispensations and we want to hear more about thousand years and we want to hear more about what's going to be happening here and what's going to be happening there and what exactly is the right sign. And it's good to be informed, my friends. It's good to have knowledge, but let's not, for the sake of information, lose the message. The message is that the Lord is coming back, and He's coming back for two things, to bring justice and judgment. <clears throat> So this day of the Lord is very, is, it's a very popular thing in our Christian culture. We see all kinds of 
of uh, books sold. As a matter of fact, we even have a special word for it. We call it Christian eschatology. Christian eschatology. And if you don't think I practice saying that word more than twice this week, you <laughs> Christian eschatology means a study of the last days. The study of the finish of something. And so it's the study of the completion of the Bible, right? It's the crescendo. It's, it's the big finale that, that, that started in Genesis and we've been living through it. And one day will come to pass that God will establish a kingdom exactly the way he first wanted it to be. You know, we have so much of this. Uh, um, uh, one of the worst feelings is to know that you're going to go somewhere and then all of a sudden be left behind. How many of you have been left behind? Um, a bus trip or something that you were going to take and you don't get there on time and psh, they're left, right? Oh, I, I remember growing up in New York, right? You, you always had to run for the bus, which then you had to run for the train, which then you had to run for the ferry boat to then catch the train on the other side to get to work, right? And this was my schedule every day, back and forth. And, and if you missed one, that was it. It was like a chain reaction, right? You missed every other one after that. And it was a horrible feeling to be left behind. You know, there's a whole series of movies called Left Behind. There's a whole series of books called Left Behind, and they're big sellers because people like the entry. People like this stuff. But because of the information, what happens is that they lose the true meaning of the message. I remember growing up in a church where, um, where this was the, 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 it was a threat. It was what they taught, right? The Lord is coming at any time now, so you better watch what you do. Because if he catches you in the middle of something you're not supposed to be doing, you're going to be left behind. You know, I remember um, uh, posters of people flying through the air and airplanes crashing and, and cars up against buildings because this rapture had occurred and everything was left without, past, without um, drivers and pilots. And, and as a little child, even having nightmares of that, right? And a uh, quick story. I was about... I was about four years old, and my mom and dad, in this particular type of church, they had services every single night of the week, right? And so um, they were at church, it was seven o'clock, they took off, and um, they went to church, and they left me with my older brother, I was about four years old, I had taken a nap, so they left me behind, with, and um, my older brother, the, the way he watched me was to go outside and play with his friends while I slept inside, right? And I remember waking up, and, and the first thing that came to my mind, even at that age, that's how brainwashed you could get with this stuff. Filled of the information, but losing the message, right? And the first thing that went through my mind was, where are my parents? They must have gone during the rapture. I missed it. I fell asleep. At four years old, I'm thinking this. I took a stupid nap and now I missed the whole rapture. And I'm crying and yelling to high heaven. Finally, my brother hears me from outside. He comes up and, you know, calms me down, lets me know, no, they just went to church. They'll be back. And everything was all right after that. But because of the information overload, we missed the message. We could use it as a threat. We could use it to put fear in people, but that's not what this is for. You see, there's actually good news here. Because the second coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, is not a horrible thing to those that are waiting for it. He even goes down this whole chapter and um, he uses these different metaphors and about pregnant women and thieves in the night. And, uh, you know, we'll get more into that as we go down the line here. But there's a concern coming from the Thessalonians. First of all, there's rumors. They have so much information, yet false rumors still arise. 
And the false rumor going around at that church at that time was this, that if you died, even if you were a Christian, if you died before the, 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 the Lord's day, no, the day of the Lord, then you would be left behind. You wouldn't be with him. And people were like, you know, now I got to try to live longer on purpose so I don't miss out on this. And so Paul addresses this, first of all, in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. He tells them in verse 14 in chapter 4, For if we believe that, that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So he's, he's affirming to them that those that have fallen, he doesn't even call it death. Right? For the Christian, it's not death. We close our eyes in this world, in this life, and we open our eyes in eternity. He calls it sleep. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go to sleep, I expect to wake up the next day. Right? So if he's calling it a sleep, it's because he's giving the hope that they will, there will be a rising up, a resurrection, awakening of these people. He also says in 16 and 17, uh, uh, after the trumpet thing, he says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So he's assuring them that the dead in Christ will rise first. And those of us who live and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord Five days, two weeks, forever. And we will be with the Lord forever. What a promise. What a promise, my friends. So now all of a sudden we enter into chapter 5 in the midst of this conversation. Paul's discussing this second coming. But from a different perspective than what we thought, or even the Thessalonians thought he was going to um, a, a talk about. And we see that those people eventually passed away. Millions of believers have come and gone. They've passed that baton to us, and we continue to believe that the Lord will return and if the Lord tarries, we teach the next generation to do the same thing. To wait on the Lord. Blessed is he who says, the Lord is coming quickly, Revelation tells us. So he begins by addressing sisters and brothers about times and dates. Times and dates. He uses um, these phrases. Um, he uses Greek phrases. One is chronos. And the other one is keros. Chronos is where we get the word chronologic. Right? Like your clock, your time, your chronologic time. And then keros is more of a time of an event that something happened. Or a period of, of a season. Right? Like we talk about the times of the Civil War. Well, we know the Civil War didn't just happen at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so we're not talking about chronological time. We're talking about keros, a time where something happens. Paul uses these both phrases here as he's trying to explain that um, to the Thessalonians, listen, I don't need to explain this to you. We've gone down through this already. We've talked about this. You know what you need to know about the Lord's coming. And you know what that is? That He's coming. And that for the sinner, for the one that turns their back on God, there is judgment. But for those that turn to Jesus as Lord and Savior, there is justice. Vindication. Finally, we'll be able to stand and say, you see, my faith was real. My belief was true. 
He says, I don't need to write to you about these things. But yet he still does. He still does. Because when things are complicated, you know what we need? We need to write down the instructions for it. Now, us guys don't like instructions, but Paul's telling them, you know, I'm going to write this down again. Because when we have a lot of things to remember, the best thing to do is what? Write it down. Write it down. Write it down. He goes, if you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So, so the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, again, right? This is a phrase that's not new to the Bible. The day of the Lord, it's not a phrase that's new to the Bible. As a matter of fact, if, again, if you want to write this down so you don't forget, I'll give you some scriptures you can look up at home and read about the day of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 46. Ezekiel chapter 13. 30 or and 30. Joel chapter 1. Chapter 2 and chapter 3. Amos chapter 5. Obadiah chapter 1. Where? Obadiah. Sephaniah chapter 1. Malachi chapter 4. See, most of these have a reference to, to um, the Lord's day, right? The, the day of the Lord. Wait, I mixed them up again. You guys aren't helping me. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, right? Okay, it's up there. So, so, so most of these have a, a, a reference to that. And it shows that for the most part that there is a, 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 just, a judgment to come up. Uh, um, a day where God brings to account all the deeds of humankind. But what we also see here, besides God's wrath, is a vindication, as I mentioned. It's also a day of salvation. It's also a day of mercy. It's also a day of grace. And it's also a day of His return. He'll come like a thief in the night. Thief in the night. See, a thief doesn't send you an, uh, 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 an embossed letter telling you, hey guys, I'm coming to your house August 31st at 7.30. Make sure all the expensive stuff is out on the bed, okay? A thief doesn't do that. A thief comes unexpectedly. I have spoken before about the difference between a thief and a robber. There is a difference between thieves and robbers. You see, a, a robber is brazen. A robber just comes up to you and says, you know, give me your sneakers. Give me what you got. Give me your TV. It takes it from you. That's a robber. A thief is a sneak. He waits for you to be unprepared. He waits for you to either not be home or be sleeping to then do their dirty deed. To um, embezzle is to be a thief. Because you're sneaking, you're fudging numbers in the background where most people can't see it. And so, Paul warns the Thessalonians. He warns us that, yeah, I mean, this may take some time. This may not happen within our schedule. But one thing for sure, this is going to happen when people least expect it. Just like when a thief shows up. That's why it's very important to prepare. But how do we prepare? By buying extra beans and cans of corn? How do we prepare? For this, uh, for the Lord's day. How, how do we do that? By living 
our lives for his honor and glory. It's that simple. As we ask the Holy Spirit to empower us, the simple thing is this, that when we come to an event in our lives, and I know this is an old phrase from the 90s, but it still applies. What would Jesus do in this situation? And can I do that? And if I can't do it, guess what? I'm surrendering it to Christ. And I'm asking his help to then fulfill that. Living our lives for him. That's our prep. Not building bomb shelters. That's our prep. I mean, if you want to prepare for a tornado, that's fine. Get a shelter. But what I'm talking about is the Lord's Day. No, is that right? Lord's Day or the Day of the Lord? That's wrong then. Yep. Okay, that needs to be fixed. I don't know how. Okay, well then take it off. Because it's confusing me. And I'm pretty sure it's confusing others. So Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 tells us, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's strong words. That's from, from loving Jesus, right? From the one holding the tender lamb in his hands. He says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father. 22, many will say to me, but Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Do we not drive out demons in your name? Do we not perform mighty miracles in your name? And then I will say to them plainly, in other words, not a parable. Remember, Jesus is speaking parables. He's telling us here, he's not going to do that then. He's going to speak plainly so they understand, right? Plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Question, why didn't Jesus know them because they were what evil doers away from me you evil doers we can't have a a, a dual devotion to the things that offend God and then have God at the same time It's hard. These are hard things to live by as Christians, but it's what makes a Christian. So why didn't he know them? Because they were evil doers. That simple. And so he goes on to talk about that while people are saying peace and safety, right? Peace and safety, he talks about. That's when real destruction will come. What's this peace and safety? What's that mean? Well, this is a, a throwback to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14, where he talks about you who say peace, peace, but yet there is no peace. It's a false sense of security. It's an escapism, if you will. How many of you ever heard of the Pax Romana? The Pax Romana. The translation to that is the Roman peace. That sounds beautiful, right? Peace. Wow. You know, get some flowers in behind my ears. Peace. Roman peace. But you know how they kept the Roman peace? Through the iron hand of the emperor. There wasn't any of that that I'm in a free country and I'm free to do this and I'm free to do that. No. You followed the law or else. And following the law or else did what? It kept the rest of the people living in peace. The Pax Romana. It's, you know, it's about people that, that, that live in an escapism that as long as things are good with me, as long as things are peaceful with me, I don't care what happens to anyone else. I don't care what happens in this world. We have all the information, but we miss the message. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 and 39. Jesus himself refers 
to this type of situation. As the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day of Noah's and until the day Noah entered the ship. And they didn't know until the flood came. And it took them away. So will it be during the coming of the Son of Man. On the day of the Lord. People will be so bogged down with distractions. Distractions. Distractions are all around us. There is always something calling your name to pull you away from the path that you should be walking on. Neil Anderson in his book, The Bondage Breaker, a very great book, if you could ever get it, read it. He's a psychiatrist who then gave his life to the Lord and now sees psychiatry, psychiatry through the eyes of, of God's spiritual um, world. And he makes this comparison. He says, the life of the Christian here on earth is like a person walking down a crowded city block with three and four and five story brownstones all the way down. And on every single one of those windows, there's somebody calling your name and your job is to walk straight down the middle of that street. Could you picture that? And every window, somebody's calling for your attention. And your job is to walk to where Jesus is. Your job is to walk with Jesus. Yet we are full of distractions. This is what Jesus was trying to say with this reference to Noah and the ark. He wasn't saying getting married is wrong. He wasn't saying giving and, and taking a marriage is wrong. He wasn't saying having vacations and having a good time are wrong. What he's saying is that when we become so distracted with those things that we forget him, then something wrong has happened. Because distraction eventually turns into destruction. As it was in the days of Noah. Pain. Pain. He talks about pain for a woman who's going to give birth. Now, with today's science, we kind of know what most women know what their due date is, right? I mean, am I right or wrong on that, right? With today's science, a doctor could tell you your due date is. But still, we still don't know when those pains are going to start. I remember with our first son, it was 10 o'clock at night. And I was watching Buck Rogers in the 21st century. <laughs> and Lillian tapped me on the shoulder and says, I need to go to the hospital. And I said, why, aren't you feeling well? She says, no, the baby, the baby. And I've told this story before we go out. Our car had gotten stolen that day and we couldn't find a car and we come back to call for help. and. The person that was going to drive us to the hospital showed up with a small car where only Lillian fit and I had to run five miles uphill and five miles back, whatever. Anyway, but he makes this comparison that the day of the Lord or the, 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 the Lord's day, the day of the Lord. <laughs> The day of the Lord is like a woman going into labor. We know something good is going to happen. We know something exciting is going to happen. We know something beautiful and spectacular is going to happen. But we just don't know exactly when. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, this portion of this this week Paul wants to make sure that the church understands this point that we don't get bogged down by all the information and wind up losing the message the message is this simple that we wait faithfully 
for him who has completed every other promise to fulfill this one. That's where our victory is at. He won our victory. And when we are in him, we have victory in the Lord. So next week we'll be going into a little bit more of this. We'll probably be attacking some other verses like verse 9 which says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What a great verse, huh? So God willing, um, we'll be going more into that. But for this week, I'll end with this last verse in Luke chapter 21 verse 28. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is near. Something to celebrate. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this word. We thank you for your promise. Your promise still stands. And we know that you are faithful to fulfill it. We see what's going on in our society and around the world today. Every time there's an upheaval, every time there is a war, every time there is a different event, we know that people yell and scream, oh, it's the last days. And it's happened so much that we start to become callous, that you've never left us, nor forsaked us. And that you're bringing victory for each and every one of those that puts their trust and faith in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song.